and we'll get underway, I think. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa and welcome all local and international uh, guests to today's Lunch and Learn hosted by the New Zealand Association of Positive Psychology. My name's Paul de Bovere and I'm the current president of the association and I've got the honour of um, introducing the people and the purpose um, uh, behind today's talk. In fact, what I will do is um, in a moment invite our very own Anique Jansen to introduce the people um, as she is our um, sort of our, our conduit with um, this great uh, project that you're about to hear more about. Um, but before we do that, um, uh, we'll also put, uh, just to let you know, we'll put the link for our, um, the bios for today's speakers and panelists in the chat section below, um, in case you'd like to know more about um, the people that you're going to be listening to. Also, so we've um, just to let you know, we've got an exciting um, chat that you'll be watching and listening to uh, for the next uh, 55 or so minutes. Um, there's gold here for um, students and academics of wellbeing science, for practitioners, um, and also for parents. So I'm really excited for you all to um, take in what, you're, what has been produced for you. And also um, to remind you that there will be a QA and a and that will uh, kick off uh, after, after the talk. So around about 1 p.m. Um, and so if you do need to um, leave um, before then, uh, if you need to finish your lunch break and, and head back to work, whatever you need to do, uh, we will be sending you the link to this talk. Um, also um, know that there is a Q&A button down the bottom and if you would love to have your questions, um, so please fire them through in the Q&A um, section down there. We'll try and answer them as we go, uh, but we'll also, we're blessed to have um, some of our panelists here with us this afternoon to be able to um, talk through some of the responses to your questions as well. So make sure you um, ask, ask away. Uh, so what I'll do now is just hand you over to Anik Jansen, uh, who will uh, introduce or quick, briefly introduce our um, panelists before we um, watch our, our panel discussion. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm originally from New Zealand, but I'm uh, now in San Diego, the joys of traveling. I am the Plum Tree Learning uh, uh, um, Research and Innovation Director. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the co my co-panelists today. The session will be introduced by uh, Peggy Kern, um, Associate Professor at the University of Melbourne, the Center for Wellbeing Science. And it will, the session will be moderated by Rachel Taylor from the Center for Social Impacts in Swinburne University. The um, first uh, person that we're going to hear from is Janine and uh, she will give a parent perspective. Janine is also a peer facilitator with our programs. And uh, Kath and Anu, um, Kath Lan Catherine Lancaster and Anu Bopti will give the professional perspectives. They're both occupational therapists. Um, Anu is a lecturer and senior occupational therapist with um, uh, La lecturer at Latrobe University and Catherine is uh, with Latrobe University and are completing her master's. Uh, then uh, I will be uh, joining in and talking about my part and uh, Silvana Mamik, who is uh, Plum Tree Children's Services and now next co-creator, uh, will talk about an interesting paradigm that we've noticed in our research. Um, then Mogi Bayas Galan, who is um, our a peer worker with our uh, organization and also our research analyst will give a, um, a, a snapshot of the global um, uh, the research results that we've obtained. And finally, uh, Tim Moore, who, who is senior research fellow with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, will present his uh, report on a uh, research report. Thank you. It's going to be an interesting presentation. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to this session. Uh, in what ways can positive psychology interventions impact parents raising children with disability? To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I'd like to pay my respect 
to elders of the Kulin Nation, and I extend that respect to other Indigenous and Aboriginal people who might be present today, who might listen to this along the way, who might be impacted by our work, and whose perspectives and cultures and ideas can impact upon our work as well. We're in for an exciting presentation today. I'm joined by a whole host of researchers, practitioners from several, from New Zealand, from Australia, um, as we look at some of the perspective, some of the research, and some of the ideas within this space. To begin with a bit of framing, um, when we start to think about where we've been in the positive psychology field, we have all sorts of interventions that have been developed over time, things like mindfulness, gratitude, strengths, mindset, all sorts of ways to impact upon individual well-being and, and functioning in order to understand who does well in life and how to help others uh, do that, do that as well. But especially when we start to take that into practice, Oftentimes, we might have some very good plans and ideas, but very quickly, things become very complex. And the reality looks a lot more challenging than we otherwise might expect. Indeed, when we start to look at the challenges that have come over the past few years, everything from natural disasters, everything with COVID, the lockdowns, people being cut off, uh, and all the disruptions politically and other ways um, in Australia, New Zealand, and other countries around the world, well, we can see that some of the interventions and ideas coming out of positive psychology can help people along the way. We also see that things are complex. And when we start to really apply the things that we're doing, um, oftentimes, some of the simple interventions that might have worked well in our studies begin to break down when we start to say, well, what does this look like in different populations? What does this start to look like with those from a whole variety of experiences, challenges, difficulties, and backgrounds that we might encounter in our work? Coming from this, my colleagues and I have suggested the idea of systems-informed positive psychology which explicitly incorporates aspects of the system sciences into positive psychology theory, methodologies, and discourse to optimize human social systems and the individuals within them. And that's where a lot of our work that's being presented today is really grounded in, which marries very well with the disability space, where there's a lot of writings and valuing of looking at the family as a system. And when we start to look at some of these ideas and how they marry together, it potentially gives us some insights of how we can use all of this in the future. Now, oftentimes when I talk about systems, people think about Brofenbrenner's socio-ecological model. So we kind of have the individual that's nested within a series of other uh, layers. So perhaps we have a child and then we have the family, peers, schools around them. And then we might have our communities. We have the broader cultures and policies around us. That's part of a systems perspective, but that's only part of it. A system is uh, is a set of, of things that are interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. It's not just a group. It's those that are coming together and actually they create their own pattern. Systems can range from very small. So for instance, we have the human body, which is full of even smaller systems within that. It can range all the way up to you know, school systems on out to the solar system and beyond. Um, and so the elements are dynamically interacting and impacting upon each other. An important concept within this is the idea of interconnectedness. It's not just about we have relationships with one another, but my actions impact upon you. You impact upon me. We impact upon the environment. And we actually have to be thinking about the dynamic ways that we interact together and the impact that that actually has on how we function um, and how others that we might be connected to are able to function and, and able to operate. Within that, 
it's helpful to actually be thinking about the different perspectives that people might bring. Um, so for instance, if I'm thinking about the family, there's the parents' experiences and backgrounds, there's the child, there's siblings, there's perhaps the school system or the disability care system and how those all interact together. And when we start to think about, well, what does the family actually need? What do the children need? Each of those might have a different perspective about what is needed. And each perspective is limited from their own, in their own way. But when we put those different perspectives together, we can start to get a more complete picture and start to move towards the best way to be moving forward and impacting upon the system as a whole, everyone that's interconnected within them. We also need to be thinking about the dynamic nature of things. Um, oftentimes in positive psychology, we might give someone an intervention with this idea that we'll see positive effects coming from that, but things are constantly changing. And, and so we always have to be thinking about, you know, what's happening over time? How are things interacting with one another? Now that we need to be thinking about uh, adaptation and emergence. We see that as systems are constantly changing and evolving, well-functioning systems evolve over time. Think about a family with a developing child. The needs of that child are changing over time. The needs of the parents are changing as there are pressures at work that are coming in and out. There are different demands from healthcare practitioners uh, and others around them. These are all changing over time. And so we need to be adaptive in our way in which we're addressing to things. We are living through very unprecedented times. And in many ways, the world is ready for a positive psychology perspective. But we also need to be thinking about what that actually looks like and how we actually take our ideas from positive psychology and intermix that with some of the complexities of our, our world. And with that, listening to different populations and thinking about how some of the things that we study and do actually apply. One of these specific spaces is very much the disability space. While there is some work looking at bringing together disability and positive psychology, oftentimes these are sort of studied in isolation of each other. And yet our group would really suggest that bringing together some of these systems and form components constants from positive psychology and thinking about families uh, with uh, you know, children with disabilities or adults themselves with disabilities, then perhaps we can find ways to think about how we can actually effectively help everyone in our systems, in our countries, in our cultures to flourish, not just those who are perhaps able-bodied, but each experience that people have, both as individuals and collectively. And so within that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Rachel Taylor, who is going to guide us through exploring some of the amazing insights, perspectives, and findings that my colleagues that are joining me today um, have to offer. Welcome to our whole panel. Um, what we're going to turn our attention now is actually to the disability space and have a few perspectives from different people who are working with children um, who have disabilities. And what I'll start with is um, I'll throw to you, Janine, who can tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a parent of a child with a disability. Thanks, Rachel. I'd just like you to take you through a wee try timeline, if that's all right. Um, she was born with severe hip dysplasia, which was an easy three months fix and a harness, 23 hours a day. Although members of the community felt free to judge and threaten to call CIS with accusations of abuse. At age five, I was arguing with her teachers that she wasn't meeting her milestones with reading, only to be told that she was fine. <coughs> right up until I went in with proof from an optometrist and further hospital appointments that her eyes weren't tracking right. They were relieved that it wasn't their teaching strategies at fault. From seven onwards, parents of children and teachers were often bringing her back to me, amazed that she had some kind of fall or accident with no complaint that would bring other children to the attention of the health professionals. It was a frustration for me that I would then take her to a doctor or nurse, only to be told that it was too late to stitch or otherwise repair. 
At age 11, her brain MRI proved that her functioning was not impaired and therefore a diagnosis of dyspraxia was given. Interestingly, she had a foot MRI at the same time, which caused some confusion and humour when we next met her orthopaedic surgeon, that she had a brain and it wasn't in her foot. At age 13, we were at the doctor's every three months, adding weight to the argument for a paediatrician to see her as she wasn't walking late. Uh, well, sorry, I wasn't walking right. 18 months later, we saw a wonderful paediatrician who finally started to connect the dots and after much testing gave the diagnosis of Friedrich Ataxia. This is a rare neurodegenerative condition with a poor prognosis, low life expectancy, wheelchairs and a de deteriorating body where eventually only her brain would continue to function normally. As it's a rare condition, local hospital and other medical professionals mainly went through the prescribed checks as a box ticking exercise with the sad sympathetic looks of those offering no hope. Until I put my big girl pants on and started to search and argue and fight back. I spoke to a researcher in London when I went over for a family wedding. <coughs> she then put me in touch with others back in New Zealand with the same or similar conditions and encouraged me to get in touch with the Melbourne Children's Research Institute. Wow, a phone call from a professional inviting us to come over and into the fold. They were much more positive, proactive and offered me much more hope than what we had in New Zealand. But eventually it was changes being made in the disability sector here in New Zealand where we were encouraged to have more choice and control over our funding that we began to see Dara as just another member of our community. Not a burden, not a drain on good taxpayers money. It changed our thinking. Talking with other parents and learning what we could see as encouragement to dreams it being seen for us becoming involved with the Now and Next program. Life-changing is how I describe it. A journey, not a destination, setting the platform for daring to hope and dream for more. Continuing to progress and improve our quality of life separately and together. As a parent, I'm so much more relaxed now and my daughter feels so much happier to be around me. She flourishes now and feeling empowered to choose. To choose. At age 20, she now lives independently with flatmates her own age, is training her own service dog, drives a modified car, plays wheelchair rugby, in tournaments around the country now <clears throat> and argues with me for what she wants in life rather than sitting moping and waiting to be done to. She makes me proud and it's an ordinary everyday outcome for any parent of a child having survived her teens. Thanks Rachel. Thanks so much Janine and I think so much of what you speak to is what we're going to be covering today thinking about how do we shift this focus in disability away from this deficit um, to a more empowered and strength-based focus. Um, bringing in a whole systems approach that treats the individual as part of a community and a wider system rather than just someone that's in isolation that needs to have stuff done to them. Um, so Catherine and Anu, I might throw to you now to talk from a practitioner perspective about um, what it means to work with families with a disability. Catherine, do you want to go first? Thanks, Rachel. Um, I work as an occupational therapist and um, I find when parents are seeking services, I find that when I ask, how can I help, the family will tell me that the paediatrician told them that they need an OT or um, they don't exactly know what they uh, help they actually need. Um, my time with the family is then trying to understand the family and what's important to them and then reframe their desires and expectations into the way the system works. Our system is a deficit-based model which focuses on what the child can't do, not what the family and the child can or would like to do. The family is often at the beginning of their journey with their child and it's unusual for any parent to think in terms of goals for their child's future. So I'll spend time with the family to develop the goals um, and this is the language the service uses to direct interventions. Sometimes a family will say um, that it doesn't know what goals they have or they don't have any goals for their child uh, and they might ask for the opinion of the clinician, what goals do you think I should have? Moving the control of the decision making from the family to the clinician. This is an important moment um, that happens when families are beginning their engagement with services and it's important to get this right for families. Thank you, Catherine. And Anu, I know you've done a lot of research in this area as well. Could you talk us through what you think some of the key opportunities are for us to improve things in this space? 
Yeah, thanks, um, Rachel. So just going on from Catherine, so I'm also a clinician and um, an occupational therapist, a researcher and so on. And um, some of the things that I um, think that we use a lot in as practitioners is well-meaning gatekeeping that we do with our families. So it's about feeling that we need to protect the family. So instead of um, showing them information and you know having a faith or a trust that they will be able to deal with the things that are there that would help them. There is this overprotective concern for parent well-being that we see in a lot of practitioners. So, you know, when they come to you with a question like, um, I never did goals for my other children. Why do I need to do goals? You know, I don't understand what this goal setting is. And so they look at you towards you as the practitioner, as towards you as the expert. And here we are trying to, you know, get away from that model of, um, I'm, I'm the practitioner, but you're the parent, you have the power. So I think um, they come with that mindset because they're coming from a medical model, a deficit-based model, where um, they're kind of being told that someone's going to help you. They think it's going to fix the problem and we're here to fix, whereas it's, it's a lot different to fixing, isn't it? It's more about getting children to function, getting children to achieve things just like their peers, but it's also keeping the family unit going. And that's where all the work that I do, it works around that, the whole family unit working together, using those positives that we, we hear so much about in positive psychology is the belief system, the hope, you know, the values that they hold. And we know that parents love being the caregivers. They like being a parent. They want to parent their children. So that is... A positive it's not like yes it takes away from the time of working or other things but we do know that those things are there and they help parents you know move on and actually using those strengths in um towards helping children achieve goals is the key according to what we know from the research and from our work thank you anu i'll bring in anik and sylvana now they're and the rest of our session, we're going to be really focusing in on the Now and Next program that they developed um, and what they describe as the program that they needed when their, their kids were little. Um, Anik, I'll start with you. Could you talk to us a little bit about why you developed Now and Next um, and what does it set out to do? Thank you, Rachel. So um, a, a step uh, backwards, it's just before that to see where it came from, where our thinking developed. And uh, we have a graphic that's called our three um, It describes uh, at a high level, firstly, our evidence base, which is the bottom level. Um, secondly, where the focus of our attention is in the system. And thirdly, that the impact we're wanting to achieve is, as shown on the top band, to build family capacity through participation. So participation is just what Anu and Kath were talking about before when they were talking about setting goals and working on their goals. This theory of change is linked to a website with more explanation about each one of the parts. Um, so within a system-informed positive psychology perspective, we're working with three elements of the system. On the left, historically, the disability sector assigned the responsibility on professionals to create effective partnerships with families. But as family-centered practice developed, the focus became increasingly on families and on their roles, which is on the right of this um, theory of change. However, what we're founding in our research and developing uh, peer uh, workers as a workforce of its own uh, is an, another element which is in the center of this uh, theory of change. Then the role of emerging family leaders is revealed as an increasingly important link between professionals and families. Perhaps we can talk here about leverage points in a system. We achieve outcome by running evidence and a base program, now and next is one of them, to increase families empowerment, hope, agency and well-being. During the program, which is done face-to-face -face or via Zoom, parents and carers learn with their peer groups to formulate and achieve an inspiring goal for their children, build novel positive partnerships with professionals, optimize the informal networks. 
And in, in terms of sustaining the outcomes, which is uh, uh, um, one level of the theory of change, there are three groups of people converging as a community of practice level and how learning continues for each group and between groups. Uh, now next is a, uh, based on a positive psychology approach. It's a strength-based intervention. It's an eight week or 20 hour program for parents with children with disabilities. Evidence-based positive interventions. So for instance, character, strength, mindfulness, well-being, et cetera. It starts with a prospection uh, in, in positive psychology terms, um, uh, intervention uh, activity to set inspiring goals. Um, the program empowers parents to formulate and achieve goals for their child, their family, and for themselves. Parents are connected into different channels practices. Um, peer parents are trained to run the program. In short, it was a program we needed when our children were little. Savannah and I both have adult uh, children, adults with uh, uh, additional needs. So we launched a pilot, pilot version in 2015 and have since then incorporated parents' ideas through active co-design. Uh, you can see a very short uh, movie about uh, Pictability, which is the bespoke tool, tool that we built based on positive psychology uh, uh, concepts such as prospection. So Anu and Cass talked about the challenge for parents to set meaningful goals instead of handing over their controls to professionals. Parents have their own expertise, but how to do it because we found that a conversation is not a good um, medium for having or for opening up inspiring possibilities. So we designed that bespoke tool and you can have a quick look at it. Life. Sometimes it doesn't go to plan, especially when you're the parent or carer of a child with a delay or disability. You seem to always be on the go, but left wondering if you're actually getting anywhere. What if we told you, you don't have to feel like this? Pictability allows you to catch your breath. Have a play, follow the steps, take your time. By the end, you'll be reconnected with what's important to you, your child and your family without even realizing it. That's just how Pictability works. Pictability helps you turn what's important into what's achievable. What's achievable then turns into a map for a great life, your family's life. And before you know it, you're on your way. Thank you, Anique. And I think one of the things that really stands out about the Now and Next program is just how beautifully produced all your materials are and the level of thought that has gone into them, in addition to that really well-established evidence base that underpins everything that you're doing. Um, Silvana, I might turn over to you now, because alongside co-creating the Now and Next program with Anique, uh, with Anique. Um, it's also served as the basis for your PhD. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your research findings in there? Hi, I continue the systems informed positive psychology perspective as a lens through which we viewed the experiences of parents of young children with disabilities. Here I present an illustration to summarize a case study. We critically examined typical approaches to disability supports for families of young children, identifying the existence of two dominant paradigms. These are disability is a disadvantage and expert knows best, which we see on the left-hand side of this illustration. Families participated in a strengths-based program informed by a systems-informed positive psychology approach and co-designed by uh, professionals and parents. Thematic analysis of the program records and focus group data identified two primary themes representing alternative perspectives that arose throughout the intervention. These are on the right hand side of the illustration and they are, we will start with our strengths and we've got this. Participant comments indicated 
that they developed a greater sense of well-being concepts and practices in their communications with their children. Examples of these comments are under the seesaw. The case study provides clear examples of the shift in perspectives that occurred and suggests that the incorporation of systems-informed positive psychology principles within early intervention approaches provides a potential pathway for shifting the problematic paradigms that dominate disability care. We've demonstrated this systems shift as occurring through a downward pressure as illustrated on the right hand side of the seesaw. Thanks Silvana and I think one of the real strengths that underpins in our next program as well is your dedication to methodological rigour um, in the, the research approach that you've taken. Um, and Moggy, I know that you've been doing a lot of work over the many years that Now and Next has been running, um, gathering a lot of data um, and analysing that data around these key measures that really connect to levels of empowerment and hope and well-being in your participants. So I'm going to turn over to you now to tell us a little bit about your involvement and the findings of the research that you've been doing so far. I am a mom of two beautiful young boys. And my eldest son, Tengus, he is seven years old and he has a diagnosis of autism. I am, came across this program when my son was really young, just after receiving a disability diagnosis. This program gave me tools to really activate my own agency and made me realize I can drive the change and made me realize what's important for us as a whole family. It made me see my son's diagnosis and my reaction to it from a different angle and much and much more positive and ho hopeful side. And after I completed the program, they just tapped on me on the shoulder and asked, hey, would you like to be involved um, with this work? And that's how I become involved with this amazing program. So I brought in my prior work and educational experience. I have been involved with extensive data collection, as you said, Rachel, and analysis around the key outcomes and measures. The dashboard you are seeing on the screen, it summarizes our uh, global achievements so far since 2015. Now next program, it has been carried out in four different countries, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Finland. And we have done the program with 57 groups of families and 565 uh, families completed the program and joined our alumni network. And from those families, almost close to 50%, it's 48%, families are from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And we have also um, organized and hosted four conferences and more than 500 families attended these conferences. These conferences are by families and for families conferences. And we have trained 34 peer facilitators, a parent, they delivered the program. And families, when they came to the program, they set three goals. A goal for uh, their family, a goal for their child, and goal for themselves, the personal goals. And then they work to achieve those goals during that eight weeks. And we can see that over 90% of uh, families, they have achieved their goals during the program and, uh, and in, in the face-to-face -face sessions and over 85% of families achieve, achieve their goals in online sessions. We use a number of standardized outcome measurement tools in our evaluation for the program, such as PERMA, Psychological Empowerment Scale for Parents of Children with Disability, HOPE Theory, etc. So you can see on the screen um, the families have been reporting a positive outcomes 
in terms of increased empowerment, increased skills and knowledge and agency and then hope at the program compared to the beginning of the program. So this blue part on the graph it is the baseline they reported at the beginning of the program. And the, the very bright green one is the gain they achieved during the program. We also see increasing pa parent satisfaction about the program over the eight sessions. Even more so, we see amazing comments and quotes and feedbacks coming out. For example, in this slide, we, we included a couple of feedbacks that we received from the parents. A wonderful program that has helped me embrace my son's strength in order to build confidence and identity. Now next was everything I hoped for and more. I feel supported, empowered, and armed with all the tools I need to break things down and more work more easily towards the outcomes. Be there for my son, my family is a unit of, for me personally. I have done a lot of work on myself over the last few years and focus on strength and positives already. So this cause just strengthened by outlook. Thank you for, thank you to all the peer facilitators who are knowledgeable, passionate and welcoming, warm, come to South Australia. It's a, it's a parent quote from, um, South Australia. This course has been extremely beneficial for me, um, men for, for me, mental well being, and as a result, has influenced to me to parent and advocate for my child better. It has also given me the ability to take a step back in my personal relationships and ac access things from access things from different angles and viewpoints. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moggy. And alongside Moggy's analysis, uh, Tim, you've also been conducting an independent evaluation of now and next. Can you talk us a little bit through what you found in that evaluation? Thank you, Rachel. Yes, um, I'm a psychologist. I'm, I work at the Centre for Community Child Health, which is part of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute that Janine referred to before. Um, and we were asked to do an independent evaluation um, of the Now and Next program. And we were looking, um, this is done um, several years ago, we were looking at data from 15 Now and Next groups that were run between January 2017 and March 2018. And there are 154 families of young children um, involved in these programs. We used a mix of qualitative and quantitative methods. We were looking at both the process um, of the delivery as to whether it was delivered as it was intended, etc., and the outcomes. The specific questions that we looked at in the process evaluation was, did the program get to the intended target groups? Was it delivered as intended? And how did the participants rate the program sessions? you can see the outcomes evaluation um, questions which were uh, did parents achieve the short-term goals um, that they formulated we obviously couldn't measure the long-term goals um, how did the parents um, empowerment before the program compare with their empowerment afterwards uh, so the, the, these are the positive psychology elements how did their hope scores compare with their hope scores afterwards and how did their well-being um, compare after the program. We used a participatory research approach. We had parents participating in the evaluation during um, the participant uh, during their participation in the program. Parent peer facilitators who were running the program were trained to collect and record the data real time during the program. So we could use that real time data to modify the program. And a parent peer worker, Moggy, um, assisted with the data organisation and analysis um, process. Did the program reach the intended target groups? Uh, well, we had an average attendance rate across those groups of nearly 80% over an eight week program, falling off towards the end, but a pretty strong representation. 
And what was particularly interesting was we had the, there was a high representation from culturally and linguistically diverse families, 60% of participants, an unusually high percentage, and also um, a good representation from fathers, another unusual finding. Was the program delivered as intended? Um, yes. Um, there was comprehensive and systematic documentation of the session for use by peer facilitators and there was real-time monitoring of feedback and that was incorporated into the program for continuing improvement. And how did the participants rate the program sessions? Their ratings generally increased session after session over the course of the program. With the exception of session five where scores always decrease slightly and then picked up again. No reasons for that. To what extent did parent participants achieve the goals they formulated? Um, and here the program was highly successful in providing all parents with the experience of developing and achieving short-term goals. There are a total of 134 child goals, 137 family goals, 117 personal goals were recorded and more than nine in 10 participants achieved all three. Now this is remarkable when you think that this is a group that's starting um, that is only working with other parents and with each other and yet demonstrate that they can achieve things without the um, help of professionals being involved. To what extent did parent participation become, participants become empowered? We had uh, not a complete set, but a subset of participants showing statistically significant increases in their empowerment and in their sense of agency. So the positive psychology elements are working there. And to what extent did parent participants' well-being improve? Again, we only had a subset of participants complete the general measure of well-being and on average there was a statistically significant increase in participants health, happiness, optimism and a decrease in their negativity and loneliness over the course of the program. Again the positive psychology element showing out. Um, this shows um, the question that we had um, about a program like this is what are the active ingredients, what are the elements of it that are most important. There's a complete list of potential um, active ingredients. Is it the parent contact that makes the difference? Is it having a structured sequence of um, sessions? Is it using parents as facilitators? Is it the positive psychology framework? So you've got a whole list there um, of, um, now are they all important? If we only got half of them right, would it still be effective? Um, these we don't know. I know which ones I put my money on, but we really need to demonstrate that um, empirically. So conclusions. Um, on the evidence of this particular study, uh, the program is highly successful in providing parents with the experience of formulating and achieving short-term goals. Um, and that, um, as I would argue, is extremely important in early child intervention. There are signs uh, that the program also appears to empower parents and promote their well-being. Um, I'm being cautious about what we're saying there, not because I think the program doesn't do it, but because the evaluation wasn't good enough to show it. Given the limitations of the methodology, the program can be regarded as promising. Further research is clearly warranted. This should involve trials in other sites with larger numbers and more rigorous research methodology and the key questions we want to address are what are the features of the program that are most central to its success and are the short-term gains found in the present evaluation sustained over time and of course does it achieve long-term goals uh, and I'll leave it there back to you Rachel. Thank you so much Tim and as a team, so this group that is speaking to you today is part of a bigger research program as well. So we're going to be continuing that building on the work that Moggy and Tim spoke to, um, to really start to understand what is it that's going on in the Now and Next program that's contributing to these outcomes um, for these families. 
Uh, so we'll finish off today with just what I'm terming a few little take home messages for each of us. Um, Janine, I know earlier you spoke to your experience as a parent and that shift that happened for you um, we're in encountering now and next and this transition away from a deficit focus to a more strengths based focus. Um, could you give us a few thoughts on what you think this impact can be for parents um, and the impacts of something like now and next? Yeah, thanks again, Rachel. <clears throat> I think the one of the key takeaways is that um, there's a change in our relationship thinking that we now see um, you know, ourselves as parents and professionals now in partnership and that um, there needs to be that acknowledgement that the parents are the experts and the professionals um, contribute to our whānau's wellbeing rather than um, tell us, perhaps. And um, I, it's been a big shift for me that community really does play a bigger part in um, our um, thinking today as well it should. And it's quite nice to get back to that maybe you know, um, 70s, 80s way of thinking about our community. And I have noticed that um, talking with some other parents that they're now less inclined to shift their children when there's a problem at school because they see it as part of their community rather than as there's the problem, it's the school that's the problem, we need to move our child out of the community. So keeping the child in the community, being more willing to work and um, put pressure back and a bit more onus on those um, professionals as well. For me, I see things so much more positively now and value the input um, from professionals so much more. And I'm a little bit more, a lot more <laughs> realistic about um, the expectations from the professionals. So when we go to those meetings with um, different departments in our um, hospital system, I understand that there's no cure and there's no fix all but we have a, a full and frank discussion and we start to discuss things more realistically. So they, you know, the professionals are much more relaxed around me and understand that I'm understanding and therefore they can be a lot more frank and forthcoming and discuss possibilities more. Um, for me personally, again, my daughter's outcomes are so much more meaningful now. She, she, she's happier, she's calmer, she's more relaxed. She's, she's not going to hide in her room for the rest of her life as she thought she was at the age of 18 when I said, no, you're not. And um, she, you know, her friends are from the disability community just as much as they are from um, her, her past school friends and making new friends and, and being more comfortable out, out in, in the public. And uh, I can't tell you how much happier that makes me. I'm an ordinary mum now instead of someone with, you know, a big chip on my shoulder. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much, Janine. And Anu, can you talk from that, then the perspective of those service providers and professionals in this space? What impact do you think this might be having? Yeah, thanks, um, Rachel. So just before I get into that, um, we need to remember the model that we talked about that is based on positive psychology. So it is the family quality of life model, as you can see in that slide, which I just thought was a nice time to bring it in now, so this is a dynamic model and it was the work of Zuna and her friends and they talked about there are several factors, not just professionals or the family, but there's a lot of factors that um, are predictors or mediators of uh, the family's quality of life and it is based on a positive um, positive psychology concepts rather than stress and depression and anxiety and things like that. So they talk about um, demographics, of course, like um, the family, like finances and employment status and stuff, but also talk about beliefs, expectations of what families see themselves and a the family unit dynamic. So there's the internal things that you can see them like a gearbox, how they intertwine and they make um, smooth movement possible if they're all working in unison with each other. But then there are on the dotted lines around, you can see that there are many other factors like early childhood intervention services or the now and next programs or um, family centered practices that kind of dictate what they're the mediators of a good family quality of life. And we actually did some research on early childhood intervention services with 122 families and we found that clearly family characteristics and beliefs along with the family friends and um, strategies such as problem solving, um, positive coping, belief systems, values of being a parent 
and their own faith actually helped family quality of life. So this was um, it's similar to what's written in a past um, you know, literature about positive psychology, we clearly found that parents were talking about these qualities, that these were actually helping them. Um, so their scores seemed high on family quality of life. And we were quite surprised that, you know, there's a lot going on, but what is it that keeps them going? So it's good to remember, yes, we are a small part of that circle or that gear, that the, of the wheel that's moving. But on that right side, on uh, that slide, you there are challenges so it's not always smooth sailing so as practitioners and service providers we kind of um, remind ourselves where parents talk about these things that poor health lack of sleep lack of funding lack of um, coordinated care that they receive peer-to-peer -peer support and especially times in their life so there are transition points like when they receive their diagnoses when they move into a school when they have to leave school go to university these are the times when the wheels start getting you know a bit tight and don't move smoothly till the parents find a uh, yes you know they reach an equilibrium and then they start moving smoothly so that's the beauty of family quality of life that it's not dependent on one thing it's dependent on all these different systems that work together and we don't expect it to move all the time smoothly but it just being mindful that these things programs like now and next programs where our practitioners are you know family focused or look at strengths are actually um, very important to the flow of the quality of life wheel thanks rachel thank you anu and in line with this systems approach, of course, we have these broader macro systems that impact on us. Um, so, Tim, I might turn to you now to have a bit of a chat about what you think this shift um, that Now or Next is helping facilitate might mean from a policy perspective. Um, I think the th key thing here has to do with um, parental um, ability to formulate and achieve goals. Um, in, in the early stages of, the, of um, being a parent of a child with disability, parents tell us that they feel um, profoundly disempowered. They don't know um, what they don't know. They don't know what their goals should be. The whole concept of forming goals, as Anu has said, is quite strange to them and so on. Um, I see the Now and Next program as a kind of circuit breaker um, because um, people come out of this thinking about what they want to achieve for themselves and their children and their families um, and be much less inclined then to engage the professional system in a um, passive way, um, thinking that the professionals are going to be the ones who are going to tell them what to do. Instead, the parents um, are the ones who can tell them what to do that's the empowerment notion. That's what I think uh, now and next does. Thank you. Thank you. And Janine, I think you can talk a little bit to the New Zealand example from a policy perspective as well. Most of us are here in Australia. Um, so you've got some expertise, I believe, in New Zealand. Yeah, thanks, Rach. I'm from the um, mid-central region. And um, you're right, Tim. <laughs> we are expecting more. We do have those higher expectations and um, we do have to thank those that went before us um, in this journey in the disability sector. But over the last three years, I've noticed that there's more flexibility in thinking that allows for programs such as Now Next and others. And from it, we expect more. The disabled and those that support them as needed, particularly family Fano, we expect to be considered as the experts. We so rightly are in our own lives. <clears throat> we expect to be actively involved in all decisions made relating to the disability sector and our respective communities. Those with disabilities in, our in their Fano expect more autonomy in relation to their own funding, meaning greater choice and control. We're no longer liking the idea that we're being done to because of the system administering from afar. It's bottom up rather than a top down approach with feedback filtering through and up at all levels. There are those with disabilities in their whānau who contribute to policy at government levels through various ministries and DHBs, uh, at the local and regional council levels, and in our own homes and communities, to give just a couple of, a few examples of how people are using our expert, their expertise at this level that they're comfortable with. 
again, here I am today with the support of peers much more experienced than I, influencing change in my own small way. Whānau, family, acknowledge various strengths and abilities and encourage all to contribute at their own level of expertise and comfort with providers, local NASCs, and others involved with supporting those with disabilities to choose their own way of life. I feel that policy makers are struggling to adapt and keep up with these new expectations and merging with expectations around responsibilities for funding parameters. Deficit level funding gaps should be identified, monitored and controlled by the individual until the day that we no longer see disability as a deficit or a quality point of difference. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Janine. Um, Peggy, I might bring you in here to sort of give us a positive psychology angle on all of this, um, given that we're, we're talking to a positive psychology audience. What do you think this all means from a positive psychology perspective? Thanks, Rachel. I think, uh, you know, thinking about working in this space, a few key takeaways I can really see. Uh, number one, when we start to think about how positive psychology really fits within this space. Um, I think throughout this presentation, we've really seen those aspects of the complexity that really sits here. There are different assumptions that are sitting very deep within, dis, uh, with, within uh, uh, care practices, our funding models, things that filter down to the lived experiences of families um, but, you know, if we just come in and start to use some of our interventions without actually thinking about the context within that, in many ways, we're not even going to get an audience. I think one thing that's been beautiful about the Now and Next pro program is the co-creation that has happened. And I think, you know, we really need to be thinking from this more, you know, a systems informed perspective to be thinking about what elements of positive psychology are relevant. But what does that actually need to look like within the context that we're sitting in? It's not just a simple approach to things, but it's really thinking about the complexity, but finding sort of the, the simple levers or what we've called simplexity. So the simple areas of change while keeping in mind that complexity. For researchers, I think we need to be, I, I think when we start to go in this space, it actually opens up a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges. We actually have to start to think, what can we actually robustly evaluate and what is actually going beyond some of our normal ways of doing things? We actually need to be thinking about different approaches to evaluation that are capturing the lived experience. Um, a simple treatment and control group doesn't necessarily always work when we're starting to look inside this complexity. We also need to be thinking about our tools. So many of our tools are really around sort of the kind of actually pretty high functioning, normal so-called people, whatever normal is. And when we start to think about, you know, those with disabilities, they have so much we can actually learn from that actually might revolutionize the way that we actually do things so that everyone can actually have a voice. And I think as a whole, what this really speaks to is if we're really going to have an impact, we actually really need to have that close connection between researchers and practitioners. And so we're really understanding the lived experiences of families, of people of all walks of life, but we're also, it's challenging us as researchers to become creative, to step out of our typical boundaries, explore some spaces that we otherwise might not trod, but through that, we're going to develop a better understanding of how to create good functioning for all people from all walks of life and not just those who fit perhaps within the narrow boxes that we can put people in at times. Thanks so much, Peggy. Um, Anik and Silvana, first of all, congratulations on the work that you've done with Now and Next so far. Um, I know we've only really scraped the surface today in terms of what it is and what it's accomplishing. Um, and I know that it continues to grow and evolve as well. You've recently launched new versions for primary school age children, new versions for adolescents. You've been working in partnership with different state governments. Um, if they want, if people want to know a little bit more about Now and Next, Anik, what should they do? Thank you, Rachel. But all I've got to say is 
with a team of people like this around us, how else could we not? Uh, it's just absolutely amazing that we, we bring together and integrate so many different perspectives and so many different uh, angles to uh, the topic that we're studying. In some links, uh, one is the now, uh, link to the Now and Next program. Another one is to our theory of change because that takes a wider lens and other pe people might be interested in a different part of it. There's also a link uh, from the New South Wales Department of Education who chose the tool that we've um, uh, explained about earlier, Pictability, as one of the seven innovation projects last year. So if people are interested, they can click on that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you. And Peggy, for those interested in knowing a little bit more about SIP, the Systems Informed Positive Psychology Direction, um, where should they go? Uh, thanks, Rachel. So I do have information on my website and you'll see the link right there. Um, it's a growing community. We'd love to bring others on. We have so much to learn and we'll only do that as we all work together. Thank you. So Janine, Catherine, Anu, Anik, Silvana, Peggy, Moggy and Tim, thank you so much um, for joining us today and for contributing to this rich, rich discussion that we've had. Um, I wish you all the best do that as we all work together. Thank you. So Janine, Catherine, Anu, Anik, Silvana, Peggy, Moggy and Tim, thank you so much um, for joining us today and for contributing to this rich, rich discussion that we've had. Um, I wish you all the best. And welcome back. Um, we will get ourselves uh, back onto your screens. Uh, panelists, feel free to uh, turn on your videos and we'll go from there. Um, okay. Now, um, what a fantastic uh, program and um, I'm sure you'll agree that, uh, you know, we're been um, pretty fortunate to hear from uh, people that have put a lot of, of work um, into learning about and um, modifying practice and sharing their, sharing their learnings with us. Um, we've got some questions. Um, thank you to those of you that have put some questions in the chat. Um, thank you, Jane. Um, and uh, First of all, I've got a question um, from Jane asking about what age range of the child with extra needs that this program is most suited, uh, suitable for or intended for. Um, and Jane's interested in what the upper limit might be. Um, um, I'll, I'll put that to the panel if you, um, I'm not sure who's best suited to answer that question. Go for it. Okay, have a go. So the original uh, program, the Now Next program, was designed for people, for parents who have a child, a young child uh, with disability. So that would be up to school age, basically. And gradually, uh, parents have been asking more and more what happens afterwards. And um, so as a result, uh, we have been working on developing two more versions of the program, one for um, child uh, at school age and one for teenage, um, which we are in the process of piloting in various uh, uh, populations. So, yeah, early intervention is still the best. Um, I see that there's some people in there as attendants who are from early intervention, and it's great that you joined us today, uh, of course, because the prevention is, is uh, the earlier you attend to. Uh, some of these topics, issues, the better of uh, the child and, is the fam and the families. But there's also uh, those parents and families who have uh, older children who are, and some of them are also in the audience today. And um, yes, we need to absolutely uh, apply positive psychology and we're developing now when piloting, you know, what might be the best approach for each different age. And yes, Peggy, I really agree with what you were saying at the end of your presentation that 
uh, we need to make sure that we have those tools that will capture the complexity of, uh, of the experiences that happen. Because one of the things we know also is that as, as a child grows up and if the parents do not have uh, good uh, capabilities to address the issue and build their capacity, they, it, is, uh, extreme, it can be extremely, extremely draining. So um, it's important to make sure with positive psychology that we can um, build capacity at all ages. Did you want to answer it, Janine? You did the now next program with uh, 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 your daughter is much older. Yeah, yeah that was the other thing. Is I, I did it when uh, my daughter was 18. She's 20 now, 17, and um, really did make a difference to um, our thinking, as you saw in the video, but also um, I understand about the graphics being pitched for a younger age, but I just changed my focus to, you know, my daughter attending university and what she wanted at her age and found that I could still do it in an age appropriate manner. So I think that that's of value as well. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, thank you for responding to that. Um, I wondered, um, uh, just while, uh, well, well, we've got you, Janine. Um, mm. It seems like there was a lot to garner from your experience with the program. I wonder what, um, if there were one or two pieces of advice you might offer to fellow parents um, based on the, le the learnings that you've taken on um, in terms of what other parents might be able to do um, to make small changes uh, to improve, you know, well-being for yourselves and, you, and, your, and your children. Well, what yeah. might those things be? I think you've um, said the key word there, Paul, small. Um, you know, we all start to think about the big picture. We don't think about how to get there. So those small incremental steps are the bits that um, start to really change the way we think about um, what's happening with our children. And um, I can, anything that gives you more resilience and opens up your mind to possibilities is, is really, they're the things that gave me hope. And, um, you know, I can say that I'm much more resilient now because of it. So um, if you are, you know, as a parent, if you're attempting um, this without the benefit of a program like this, start small um, and get that endorphin rush from those small achievements that actually wind up giving you that bigger picture that you probably struggle to achieve. Well, I know I did struggle to achieve because I saw this is what I want. I can't see how to get there yet kind of thing. So those small steps, they're the bits that really work for me. And it does build that resilience. It's hard to go in with an open mind to um, meetings with professionals when you, you don't have that hope. Uh, if there's no cure or, you know, anything like that. But it's, I think, re redirecting your focus instead of um, changing, you know, thinking, well, there's no cure, there's no point, or looking at the professionals who go, well, I can't help you, sorry, actually start to, um, you know, bring your tensions down a bit when you're talking with those professionals and go, okay, so how can we work together to achieve this kind of thing? And that's building up your community and, and getting those professionals on sides so that they see that you're an expert rather than a... Um, a person without hope that's, you know, wanting that big cure-all, fix-all thing. Fantastic. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that, you know, that might come with some internal challenge around having that vulnerability and that courage to... Very much so. Have those yeah. conversations. Well, thank you so much, Janine, for, um, you, know, you know, challenging us uh, as parents, um, you know, to, to work with professionals in that manner. Peggy, I wondered, um, while well, we've got you, um, from a systems, um, systems informed perspective, um, we'll, we'll do the magic wand question. If you had a magic wand um, and you could change, uh, you know, any one thing um, in order to improve well-being for, for you know, our families, that, um, well, what might that one thing be? Um, uh, well, from a systems perspective, first of all, there would not be one thing that we could do. Um, and I think that's actually one of the, the challenges when we start to look at it from more of a systems informed lens is, I think oftentimes, even in, in pause psych, we wanna have, if I do this intervention, it'll improve well-being, Or if I do this, it'll improve well-being. 
And then we get evidence for it, so then let's scale it up and that's going to change the world. And yet the reality is, that's the very complexity of our world is that we actually have to be thinking about different aspects that actually impact upon well-being. That includes things like the, the, the underlying paradigms that we have. You know, think about the disability space. What is well-being for parents? What is well-being for those with disabilities? You know, we actually, as, as researchers, we might come into that with assumptions about what that is. Um, and this is where actually we need that close work between researchers and practitioners to, to blow open some of and, 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 and research with different people themselves to actually understand different perspectives and whatnot. There are, we have different goals and different systems and whatnot that actually impact upon well being. You know, we, we think about the disability care uh, uh, seg our, our sector. We want to promote well-being, and yet even to get funding, you actually have to make a case about the level of dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, you have to play the games to show dysfunction as opposed to actually saying, how can we bring out the best? We have, you know, so then, so we can start to think about there's, there's policies and structures we have in place. There's our ways of doing things both, you know, in our different countries and internationally. There's the perspectives that we impose on parents, on practitioners, on, you know, even how we do our training and whatnot. And so if we were to actually change one thing in the system, I think, the, you know, and I think uh, one thing is even starting to shift some of our underlying, uh, identifying and shifting some of our underlying paradigms that keep driving the same things over and over again. And so it's getting out to the very heart of it um, and I think the Now and Next program is actually doing that in many ways at a small level for parents. Um, it's actually giving them, uh, I don't have to be disempowered, I can be empowered. I don't have, you know, it's, I, I can take control of what I do. And it's that pause, like focus that's entering into that. And then we actually need to think about what that looks like in each and every part of the system mm -hmm. from the, the practitioner or from those who give the care to parents, to policymakers, to the funding bodies, et cetera. So not a simple answer, but that's the complexity of the world that we live in. So the key thing is to find out what are those key levers that we can focus on at the right time to keep moving things forward in the direction we wanna go. And if I could just add the, uh, I think the, one of the important things that Peggy's touched on is that we're all as parents individuals, so, you know, that's another thing that comes through with, with this program and other things, you know, we're not all going to see the same situation in the same way. So as parents, we, we just need to look at what's in our kids and, and talk it and, um, you know, work with what we have. And that's, that's definitely another key learning. Fantastic. Uh, and thanks, Peggy, for bringing back the, um, the reality of, <laughs> of, of com the complexity that lies within within systems that we're, you know, constantly working in and, and living in. So um, I think uh, we had another uh, unanswered question down here in the q and um, It's been shifted to answer, but I think it was from Jane about um, uh, the challenges of linking in with clinicians, uh, more specifically specialists, um, or if were there challenges, um, I, I'm assuming that Jane is referring to your study if there were challenges of linking in with clinicians? Um... Yeah, I answered that question. I saw there were both challenges, but also huge opportunities. Um, there were challenges because there are some professionals, I think a very small minority, but people who, as uh, the model that um, Silvana was showing, there were people who were quite happy with being considered the expert and having you know, the knowledge and some sort of keys to certain, you know, access to certain things. But what I've encountered a lot more is uh, huge opportunities. People who are professionals, they went into this profession because they really wanted to make a difference. And they um, welcomed the opportunity of dealing with a new kind of empowered parents, parents who come, families who come to meetings uh, you know, wanting to look into the future and find more solutions. And that's a great way to work with 
um, you know, in our sector, because so often the sector of disability is, mm. as Sylvana and I were experiencing at the beginning when our children were young, mm. it can be quite uh, sad and, and people looking at you and saying, oh, well, you, you know, your life is going to be difficult. Mm. <laughs> and we don't want to live our lives like this. We want to live our lives as positive psychology talks about prospection, looking in, into the future with hope. And that's where a lot of parents that I've been working with really want to be. And we find that actually it, it really um, uh, um, it increases how, how many choices you have, how many opportunities you have eventually. So. I've got one last question and it's come from um, our uh, exec uh, member, Annalise Roach. Um, she says, what a phenomenal team working together, practitioners, researchers, academics, lived experience, and it's so powerful. How did you come to work together as a group? Um, are you funded? If so, by who? Do you have uh, set goals you are working towards and how do we replicate this in other areas? <laughs> I blame Anik for all you. of that. <laughs> Peggy, would you like to answer? I think it's the beautiful thing about just how the collaboration has unfolded. There was no sort of uh, Anik who was actually using my measure and connected with me and said, could we work together? And, um, and it's such a beautiful opportunity. It's a very open group that we, we connect with others. I think there's we, we come together with some of those. So in many ways it becomes almost a, a community of practice. Um, and um, you know, those, I think people coming together with that common heart and saying, we have different skill sets. We value each of those. No one is, is, is superior or anything. Is that because we all bring different expertise that if we put that together, we can do something that none of us can actually do alone. Mm. Nice. Wonderful. We keep working on the funding aspect. That's an ongoing, you know, uh, but uh, <laughs> as everyone is. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities there as well, um, uh, especially in the disability space to say, how can we improve this world? Great. That's so cool. And I, I think for me anyway, it, it, um, it's a challenge to, um, to reach out to other people working in the, in the same space and simply simply put the question out there. Would, would you like to connecting potentially collaborate i think sometimes too there's people you're all like oh they would never want to work with me and you might reach out to them they might never respond um but if they do you know who knows where it could lead so mm -hmm. be willing to try you know a lot of collaborations won't work but the ones that do are beautiful awesome a bit of that uh hopeful prospection eh anik Wonderful. Hey, I'd like to um, thank you all for joining us, um, our lovely panelists, and um, also to the panelists that couldn't join us uh, for the live Q&A today. Um, thank you for your contribution, especially to our wonderful um, executive member, Anik Jansen, uh, for linking us all. So um, thank you, uh, viewers and attendees. We hope that um, there's been some, some good, helpful uh, material in there for you. Uh, do keep in touch. Um, you can contact us, go through to our website and use our contact button if you're not sure how to get a hold of us. That's uh, positivepsychology.org.nz. And if we need to um, reach out for more um, questions and answers to our, our experts here, um, we'll do that um, to, to help you as well. So um, in closing, thank, thank you for today and um, have a lovely week. Thanks. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank <laughs> you.